Continue our executive and residence series. It started last year. This is our third executive and residence. Our executives come to campus for a day. And it's a full day, let me tell you. We start them out in the morning in the class, and they talk about their personal philosophy of uh, business. They come to lunch, and they have to talk again to a group of people about their companies and their um, careers and such. And then they pick a topic related to their industry and talk to you this afternoon about that. Um, and then this executive and resident is going to go on and talk to a graduate class at 5.30, and then he has to go to a dinner. So there's all kinds of things from all our days, which is typical of the business world today. And the leading executives take it all in stride, and uh, we're just delighted to have them with us. Today our executive in residence is Mr. Tarkin Mayer. Tarkin is a special executive. He graduated with an MBA in 1993 from Midwestern. And Tarkin uh, was named this last year in 2011, uh, this academic year, 11-12, as our Dillard College Outstanding Alumni uh, for current year. And we're just delighted to have him spending the day back, spending some time with us. Tarkin's originally from Turkey. He came here to do his MBA after completing a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Management at um, in, um, Istanbul Technical University, sorry. Um, and uh, so um, thought he wanted to come to a small school in what he calls the real America. So we'll let him tell you a little bit about it. But I think he got a good taste of Texas when he came here in, in the 90, early 90s. And uh, um, I think he liked what he got here in Hilton. He'll continue to tell you a little bit about it. He also, after leaving here, has had quite a varied career, and I hope he'll tell you a little about that as well. But um, one of the things he did was get a second master's, and that was a master, an MBA, an executive MBA, from Harvard after he finished here. Mr. Mayer is named president and CEO of Weiss Technology in February of 2007 and he has recreated this company that was essentially in bankruptcy and brought it into one of the leading, if not the top, company in the uh, technology, uh, global leader, computing based virtualization software and hardware solutions. Um, but we'll let him explain all of that, his industry and where it is headed. The title of this talk today is How Social and Geographic mobile and cloud computing is combined with leadership and organization lead to a fast changing world. Please do. join me in welcoming Mr. Parker. Can you can I see your passport for a second? I know Texas is another country, but I don't I didn't know that you need a passport. <laughs> can I use your passport? to travel to Texas now? <laughs> I'm driving to Dallas after this. Do I hit this to get in Dallas? <laughs> I need, do I need a visa? <laughs> this is good. So what is the passport again for? What do I need this? They go to different uh, different events outside of the classroom, so they get some additional experience. There are a lot of notes you can I read? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I was fascinated by the passport. Well, um, thank you, and thank you, Barbara, for the invitation, and really appreciate uh, to be back here. This is my third time in the last 12 months, I think. Um, as Barbara mentioned, um, I joined in uh, MSU as a student in the Graduate School of Business in 1991, and graduated in 1993, spent here another year working, and then left uh, uh, start my own businesses and so on. So coming back again 20 years later, it's very special. And glad to be here. How many uh, uh, graduate students are in this, in this lecture? Any, any graduate students besides Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> any, this is undergrad, I'm assuming. Seniors, <coughs> raise your hand for me, okay. Any juniors? Okay, sophomore, to you. Any freshmen? Great. Great, fantastic. It's a nice plan. And I'm assuming everybody's BA, right? Business, business degree here? Mm -hmm. right? yes. 
Yes. Perfect. So, um, for those who don't know what wise is, first of all, um, a, everybody knows what a PC is, and everybody has a PC at home or at work, right? Um, let me explain what my company does for a second, so there's a little bit of context, because context in life is everything. So, typical PC is a big box, uh, or a laptop PC, um, has about, uh, uh, you know, required about 300 watts of electrical power to run, 300 watts, a lot of electrical power. It has a hard disk. Hard disk moves where the operating system and applications live. It moves, creates a lot of heat, and because of that, a PC has a fan in it to cool it down. Otherwise, it breaks and burns and burns your house and burns you. <laughs> so there are a lot of moving parts in a PC. That is the reason PCs break a lot. Every two, three years, you need a new PC, a new laptop, new desktop. Even underneath this desk, there's a monitor, there's a PC. So PCs cost, in average, about $1,000. Uh, but that's just the acquisition cost. The total cost of owning a PC, a total cost of ownership of a PC, is about three to four thousand dollars a year. The chief information officer, the MIS department, is that anybody from MIS department here, from the IT department of the school? They're probably spending two, three, four thousand dollars a year to maintain the PC, to secure it, to manage it, to backup and recovery, to make sure the applications don't get lost. Sometimes PCs break because of fan breaks. Moving parts always break. Moving parts always break in mechanics, right? So that's why PC is an expensive tool. It's a very important tool, productivity tool, but it's expensive and it breaks. So what my company does is basically we turn that PC and we turn it into a midget PC, like this. Uh, basically, this is my company, what we do. This, this is basically replaces your PC. Imagine your desktop PC you have at home or at work, or at school, for $1,000, we bring that cost down to $35. It starts $35. It connects to your monitor, your keyboard, and your mouse. You put our big logo on it to promote it. And I <laughs> this is my actual desktop PC from work. I just unplug it, and then I, when I travel, I just want to show the people what we do. So this goes basically to everybody's desktop. Basically, it goes behind the monitor. and. It requires only one to two watts, which means it does not require a power cord because there is enough power in Ethernet, in the Internet network, in the Ethernet, for 12 watts. So the residual power over Ethernet, that 12 watts, actual power is plus. So there is no requirement for a power cord. So think about it. 300 watts, 7 billion people. Imagine 7 billion PCs. We are not there yet. There are only 30% PC penetration in the human population. Let's, let's assume there's about 2.1 billion people. If 2.1 billion people times 300 watts, a lot, a lot of electrical power, a lot of hot energy, a lot of hot days in North Texas, okay? <laughs> um, global warming is a reality. For those people who think that it's a hoax, it's happening, okay? Um, so the, part of this device and what we do is basically green computing. We're bringing that energy cost down. Uh, energy is very expensive. Basically, these devices, with the software built into it, brings down the energy cost basically almost 90%. You bring the energy cost 90% down. And it's a huge, huge benefit to businesses, public governments, uh, 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 private enterprises. And that's why my company is growing 100% year over year. So we do the hardware, this piece of hardware, but we also do the software, bringing the applications and operating system from the cloud. So when you're using your device, actually all you see is just like your PC, your Windows applications, your Google, your Facebook, nothing changes. The only thing that changes is where those applications reside and how you bring them down to this device and to your monitor. So basically, it's a, what we call, it's a zero client. We don't call it a computer, it's a client device. We call it zero because there is nothing on it. Everything is in the cloud, in the servers. Whether there are servers and cloud is in your private enterprise, what we call private cloud, or public cloud, just somewhere else and someone hosts it, like for Facebook, like Google. You don't carry any applications or servers in your enterprise or at home with Google downloaded or with Facebook downloaded. They're all public servers for you. That's what we call the public cloud. Or or a government cloud. Sometimes governments build systems to help citizens for better citizen services, like Department of Motor Vehicles. In some states now, you can actually take your driving test 
on the internet. You don't have to go to a department of motor vehicles. Uh, and you can actually, in some states now, uh, creating virtual driver licenses. You still get a car, but you can get your virtual driver license and you can print out once you pass the exam. There are a lot of things that are being virtualized and cloudified, if that's a word, and that's what we help doing, so to speak, uh, with the public clouds and public governments and so on. So private clouds, public clouds, government clouds, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you bring applications and user experience to a device below $50, $50 and basically below two watts, which does not require a power cord. So that's the boring side of the things that I do. The reason this is important context is because this is a, this is a disruptive technology. What, what the highways and the cars did to the railroads in early 1920s and 30s, what internet did the uh, uh, publication industry, the, the, the newspaper industry, now we're doing the, the same thing to the PC industry. This is a disruptive technology. Um, at Harvard University, there's a, a, a famous a, a writer and a, a, a thinker and philosopher, and then writes a lot of books about the disruptive technologies. Uh, Clayton Christensen writes a lot about WISE, about this concept that disrupting the technology with a new way of technology. So when you think about the overall uh, uh, um, economy, forget about technology for a second. Um, think about what is important for a, a country to survive and prosper for its citizens. What is important? Let's think about it for a second. In a foundational way, the foundation, the infrastructure, right? Think about the hard infrastructure that a country needs. Uh, all the world needs, if the world was one country. What, what do we need as a hard infrastructure? The roads, the highways, the dams, the bridges, right? The hard infrastructure. And then we need soft infrastructure. The data grid, the network, right? Think about the networks we use for uh, wireless communication. That's kind of a soft <coughs> infrastructure. On the top of that, inf infrastructure foundation for a government, for a country, for the world to prosper, you need to have strong education policy. Education is important, right? And it's very important. I mean, think about this presidential election. What are we hearing about? You know, infrastructure. We hear about education, right? Energy. Energy is important. Because without energy, you cannot have these meetings. Without light, without, without, without power, without heat. So we need energy to survive. And obviously, beyond education and energy, healthcare. Because without healthcare, we cannot uh, uh, help our you know, uh, citizens prosper. Without health, there is nothing. So beyond that, environment. Environment is hugely, hugely important. How we have a sustainable environment that, that we, we can prosper. We can have a lot of money, but there's no environment. You suffer. Look at China. China is doing very well economically, but environmentally, they are suffering. They are suffering in a, in a bad way. So it's great economy does not necessarily mean that you're going to have a great life. You need to also take care of your environment. And also a stable and secure financial system where money flows so we can survive and we can do more. So on the top of the infrastructure, think like a temple. In that on the top of the infrastructure, hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure, you need to have an education, energy, environment, healthcare, and a stable, stable financial services system. And on the top, to cover everything, on the ceiling, on the roof, you need to have a strong security internal domestic security and national security so everything's safe, so you can prosper. So these are the five plus two dimensions for a stable economy and, and happy, prosperous population, whether that's a city, state, country, or the world, right? Infrastructure, energy, education, healthcare, financial services, environment, and the security. When you think about all these seven dimensions of, a, of, a, of prosperity, Technology is in everything. Without technology, you don't have any of those seven. And within technology, when you think about technology, <coughs> even if you're in technology industry or not, you need to have a, some kind of an understanding of technology because without technology understanding, we cannot prosper because technology is driven now by heavily by consumers. Think about what you're doing right now. The typical technological trends, social media, digital media, gaming, digital Hollywood, film industry, Music, everything is being digitized. You like it or not. So the social, digital media is one side. The other piece is mobility. Everybody has a mobile device here, right? Everybody is mobile. The difference between consumer and professional is being basically fused under prosumer. We are all at home, at work, and on the go, in the classroom, constantly connected. 
Even, even, even if we don't like to be connected, we are connected. Even if you don't, you're not connected, you are still connected in a weird way. So we're going to be even more connected in the next 10 years, 20 years, in the next two, three decades, the connectedness is going to be even going to exponentially grow from whatever we see today. Our grandchildren are going to laugh at us. They're going to say, you were not connected, Dad. You were not connected, Mom, in 2012. It's going to be different even in the next three years, right? So, so when you think about technology as a driver for prosperity, about all those dimensions we just talked about, now within the technology, there are also other drivers like social media, digital media, and obviously mobility, and mobile devices entering in our lives, and also big data. What is big data? It's a hugely important uh, topic. As we move more from the PC era, and we have a C drive, and everything is in a PC, now everything is being cloudified and connected to the world, connected to data centers, public cloud, or government cloud, or private cloud, or whatever the cloud is, our information is now not contained in our PC. It's contained in someone else's data center. Trust me, Mark Zuckerberg all, all, has all your information, right? Someone else has it in Facebook right now, or in Google, or whatever that might be. So the information now is everywhere, you like it or not, you like it or not, and it's being held by someone else. Someone else was talking to me as I was walking in. Do you know about Dropbox? Dropbox is one of my competitors. Great company, and they contain everybody's information. Anybody uses Dropbox in the room? Here, perhaps a few people. Facebook? Raise your hand if you're using Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You're helping Mark Zuckerberg get richer and richer. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> a personal friend of mine, he thanks you. Uh, thank you for paying his new mansion is buying. I really appreciate that. But you need to be part of it, right? You need to be part of the social media you need, because your friends are there and your, 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 your next company is there, your family is there. It's, it's impossible to fight. So these things are going to happen as we move forward. We're going to get more connected and more connected every passing day, week, and year. And we're going to laugh at where we were in 2012, as I said, three years later. So as part of that social media mobility, the third thing is big data because all the information is now being uploaded to the cloud, all of a sudden, there is tons of data. And today, data is mostly static data, like bits and bytes, text, like uh, on our Facebook pages. But when you look at the Facebook pages now, they're becoming a lot more video bytes. That's a new word for it. Don't use it. I'm just making it up. Video <laughs> bytes, meaning there's more video, and there's more voice than ever before. Now people are posting video files, they are listening to music, they're uploading music, they're sharing music. So now the data, Condense, the density of data and the volume of data is just going nuts, right, in exponential ways. Which means there is more data than ever before. Than ever before. So there is going to be so much data, and we call that big data. And companies, big technology companies now, finding ways to harness that data and turn it into business intelligence. And knowledge is power. Whoever knows the most wins. And winning is everything. It's not being second, it's being number one. So even by going to school, we're harnessing knowledge, right? It's not only textbooks or classrooms, it's also from each other, from this lecture, from your conversations to each other, from a joke in, in the cafeteria. Every single piece of interaction is a piece of data into our brains and from us to the information systems we use, from Facebook to Google or any email system you're using. We're constantly exchanging data in some shape or form. So that big data is going to be a big, big story in the next 10 years. Let me, let me give you one example. We're still up there. Let me give you one example. I do bank with Citibank. Citibank is my banker. The reason I use Citibank, I'm an international guy. I'm from Turkey originally. I have family there. I have some uh, presence in Europe. I do a lot of business in China. I live in San Francisco. I travel 80% of my time. I'm, I'm in uh, Vista Post today. I use my credit card with my city. So I'm using the Citibank network to do multiple things. So Big data means all those transactions, all those moves, as a bank, they know or they should know where I am, what am I doing all the time at a level that it's almost <coughs> defining privacy. And now Citibank sees me also on Facebook because Citibank also lives on Facebook. They see my friends. They, they know there was a press release that I'm going to be in Vista Falls. They know I'm in Texas. So when I'm doing purchasing, they know my, my location. And think about now the contextuality the intelligence. Today when we go to Google, we type, let's say I'm just making this up, the word Italy. You're going to get four billion hits. You know, the first is going to be, do you want to have Italian food today? Or do you want to go to Italy to learn Italian? 
Or are you Italian? Or do you want to learn Italian in an Italian school in Vista Falls? There is no context. There is just one dimension, the word. Imagine in the future there is so much information out there in the cloud that the system, ecosystem, knows everything about us. The gender, our background, our religion, are we, are we married or not? Where do we live? How old are we? You like it or not, all this information is being harnessed. And think about how many services and products you can sell, you can reach the people in a very contextual way. In the future, Google and systems like this are not going to give answers only to question what, but they're going to give questions and answer questions about when, who, why, where. So the contextuality is going to just go out of, the, uh, out of this world. So as part of that, as citizens, as consumers and consumers, we need to be ready for this crazily networked ecosystem of business and economy, and in which the data is being harnessed and used for you and against you, and also take advantage of you as a consumer. So that is a huge driver. So going back, social media, mobility, and this thing, what I call big data with contextual intelligence, are the three main drivers of technology. And in the next 10 years, there's going to be a lot of job creation, a lot of love creation around these three areas. That's the reason Facebook going nuts right now. This is a Yelp. You guys use Yelp? Anybody uses Yelp? You know Yelp? Y-E-L-P? Take a look at it. Um, you, are, uh, you just landed in, in, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, um, Yelp knows exactly where you are. And Yelp knows that you had sushi in Dallas and it's going to give you the best sushi restaurant that you're gonna, you can go and eat because they know exactly what you ate in Dallas two weeks ago and it's going to propose a place to you. And guess what? When you end up in that restaurant, Yelp gets a commission. Right? And you don't even know what's going on. Uh, so to give you an idea, our life is going to get, get so connected, so contextualized, <coughs> even if you like it or not. Today I did a lecture this morning, someone said, I deleted my Facebook page, I'm out of this thing. You're not. You're still online. You're still using credit cards. Anybody, is not, anybody has not heard credit cards? Get credit cards, right? Every <laughs> credit card transaction. They know exactly where we are, what we're charging, what we're buying. So you're building a profile about you, about your demographic, psychographic, and buying and perks behavior. So what I'm trying to get to is mobility, social media, digital media, and big data, contextual intelligence are going to be everything in, 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 from a driver perspective. So my company, we're trying to take advantage of those three drivers and grow our business. From a leadership perspective, we're leading in two of those three spaces. We are in mobility space and we are in a big way in big data space. Now we're entering with my company into social media, digital media space. So to success, to succeed in business, you need to follow the money, where the opportunity is. So those three drivers in my segment, in technology segment, is changing the world. And since technology is impacting, as we talked about earlier, infrastructure, education, healthcare, energy, environment, financial services, and security. Can you imagine not to have technology and security? Can you imagine US, US armed forces can live without technology? Armed forces, technology, everything. Banking. And banks are basically IT companies, information technology organizations. Everything is technology. Energy. Everything is technology. Creating energy and delivering energy. It's not only creating, but delivering energy to a home. It's all technology. Healthcare. All technology, everything is technology in healthcare. Without technology, the nurses and doctors cannot deliver the healthcare services. They cannot make drugs, they cannot deliver drugs, they cannot provide diagnosis and therapy. Same thing for environment. And the story goes on and on and on. So what we do as wise is our technology to main technology drivers, and with those drivers influence the main buying decisions from every single segment of the industry, both private and public. So my company today is almost a half a billion dollar company. They're privately held. We have some ideas for going public in the next uh, year or so. Uh, uh, the economy is not 100% uh, uh, stable right now worldwide. Just we're waiting a little bit what we're going to do next. And, and, and this company was a, a basically a bankrupt company, as, as Barbara mentioned. In 2007, basically, I remember the days I was uh, um, delaying a $6,000 PG&E bill, PG&E is the Pacific Gas and Electric in California, to make a payroll, because we didn't have money to pay salaries to survive and, and, and to prosper as a company. So it was a very difficult time, but we focused on these areas to our vision, 
and we looked for the best people in our industry to grow our business. So we gave 15% of our business to the employees. We said 15% is yours. Just we give it ownership, so we hired some amazing people who wanted to be part of something special and build some amazing company and, and basically be part of something that they can influence, create, and change the world. So as part of that, Vice has been growing over the past five years since 2007, nearly uh, 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 average 50% year over year. The last two years, almost 100% year over year. So we are reaching this year, this fiscal year, a half a billion dollar level. So as part of that, you're doing a lot of work uh, in public-private partnerships, uh, what we call the three Ps. Because when the economy is difficult, uh, public sector is having a hard time. So we work and partner with the public sector heavily as a private sector, especially, especially in education. Because education is a big problem in our country, in our world today. As I mentioned, 30% of the people, according to United Nations data, have uh, uh, internet access to out of 7 billion people in Rock So about 5 billion people are still not connected. So there's a big digital divide uh, in the world. And there's a huge opportunity. There's a huge opportunity for everyone in our country and in the world to find a niche and be successful and find ways to connect people and to connect people, do business and create value, whatever that value might be. From any industry, from healthcare to education to environment, whatever that might be. In public sector or private sector, there's tons of opportunity. When I travel the world, and I travel a lot, I see a lot of people doom and gloom and so on. I'll tell you, the world is moving very fast. The world economy this year is going to grow about 4%. This, despite the fact that a lot of regions are suffering, uh, our actual economy is doing much better. In, in, in the US, in general, in the last two years, we're actually improving heavily. Our industry is getting better. That's why Facebook went IPO this year. Because they see the environment more stable than ever. And you also start looking at that, maybe not at this year at time frame, because of Facebook is going to suck a lot of air from the market, but you're seeing that kind of a velocity. And the next two, three years are going to get even faster. There's still going to be some economic downturn in some areas, but still tons of opportunity for people like us in the room. The young generation, the right knowledge and harness, and focusing on the right areas of success and opportunity is going to have. Tremendous opportunity for wealth creation. So as part of that, as a part of that vision and dream, you're doing a lot of work with education, both K through 12 and higher education. And that is the part of the reason I'm in town because when Barbara, you know, uh, reached out to me uh, uh, as the uh, dealer uh, business uh, uh, department um, and business school, I thought it's a perfect opportunity to go back and talk to students again. And I talked also with Jeff in the past 12 months. Um, to share some of these ideas and also learn from you and answer some questions. So I think we have a, 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 a little bit more time left, another 25, 30 minutes. I'm going to open up for Q&A. But before I do that, I just want to leave you one, one thing. Because someone today asked me a question. Hey, you came from MSU. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, how can I be successful? How can I find a great job? How can I you know, uh, uh, create more value for myself? It was in the morning time frame, Dr. Renzer. Dr. Renzer, you were in the back. It was your organizational behavior class. Uh, uh, someone in that asked the question. Um, and I'll tell you, I told that person, it's not about school. School doesn't make you. You make the school. doesn't matter where you go. It's all at the end of the day. Obviously, school is important. Obviously, the, the faculty is important. All, obviously, the interaction is important. I'm not uh, 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 putting that value, uh, and I'm not minimizing that value, but at the end of the day, it's all about the person. So, so to answer that question from the Dr. Ramsey class one more time, because it was a good question, I told the person, I don't want to give, on the record, a BS answer. Because when you hear people are, you have to work hard. Yes, of course you, work, you have to work hard. But the key piece for success is obviously to have the right passion. Passion it brings repetition. Because if you love something, you do it all the time. When you do something all the time, you get successful at it. People think all oh, is about luck. All about you know skill. Yes, there's some skill is involved. Yes, there is some luck involved in life, but you create your own luck. So people who are just like I'm not lucky, it's not happening, is that's a yes on the record again. <laughs> uh, you can repeat that. Uh, at the end of the day, if you love what you do, you do it all the time. Because you love it. If you do it all the time, you get practice and statistically proven. If you do something all the time, you get better at it. <coughs> I mean there are books written about this. Who's your favorite athlete of all times? Give me a name. What? Michael Jordan. What? 
Jordan. Michael Jordan. Is it Michael Jordan is my favorite athlete of all times. And look, I'm glad you, you brought this up. I give this example all the time, and you heard me before speaking uh, here. Michael Jordan is one of those uh, athletes that he found a way to do something optimized all the time in a smart way. Not only for one year or two years, how can I stay on top for a long time? But not forcing himself, because he loves playing basketball. That's what he loves. When you love something, doing, you do it a lot. So what happened is, and this is actually sits the problem. In high school, he went to practice an hour before, and he stayed on the court an hour later. He continued the same thing in North Carolina when he went to school. He always practiced two hours more than the other average player. And they made a calculation. He took the same shot from the same location, same position, possibly 40 to 50,000 more than any other player. Of course, based on that stat, he was averaging 8 to 12 points a quarter because his stats were much better than anybody else's <coughs> because he loved the game and he practiced all the time. So when he applied at 8 points a quarter, that's about 32 points average game. How many players do you know in their careers in NBA average 30 po 32 points a game for 10 plus years? It's not only one year, it's not only two years, every year. And his average, final average plus right below 30 because he played a long time. As even he got very old, he was competing against Kobe Bryant when he was a very young player. <coughs> so that's one example to you that love is everything. If you love the things you do, you'll do them all the time. And when you do them all the time, you will be successful. Nobody can make you fail. Even if they tell you, we're going to pay you fail, you will not fail. So sometimes people tell me, ah, Tarkan, on the record again, that's BS. It is not. <laughs> I'm the best example for you. I'm not a smart guy. I really am not. Um, what I love is business, I love technology, and I love people. And my business is all about technology, business itself, how to run the business, and people. Because in my business, in technology, it's not about age, gender, location, uh, height. It's all about brain power. Whoever has tons of brain power can create tons of things. You don't need any kind of investment. The only investment you need to have is education. Learn and create some kind of value in terms of code. As you create code, as you create new ideas and innovate and put that into a program and put that into an application, put that into some kind of a technology or hardware or software, and you make a difference, and you love that end result, you're in the game. So, in my career, my background is not technology. I studied business, and I'm running a technology company, and then the best technology company in my space. We're the number one company in our space. We have 30% market share. About six years ago, we had 1% market share. And we are the global leader. And, and we're just, we're just half a billion dollars. And we never lose a deal to a large company like HP, like Microsoft, like Dell, like, like Huawei. Whatever the company name is in my space, IBM, we never lose a deal. Because we hire passionate people, not necessarily smart people. Passionate people who are committed to getting smart. So with that love, with that passion, we have people <coughs> who have repetition all the time. They do this not because we tell them to work hard. They just work at it because they love it. When you go to their Facebook pages, they talk about their company. Because they're proud that they work and that's part of their lifestyle. Not because someone is telling them to go work for WISE or to make money or, or use WISE t-shirts because I'm going to pay you more salary. They do that anyway because they love of being something successful and that repetition makes them successful. So to answer that question again, Dr. Renzo from the previous class, going back to success and, and leadership, all we care about is here, not necessarily here. This is important obviously because without this, you don't have that basic background. But with this, you can get to this. So skills are important, but the passion for learning and creating something new and repeating something all the time that you love, whatever that might be. You might be a yoga teacher, you might be a nurse, you might be a doctor, you might be a brain surgeon, you might be an astronaut. I don't care whatever that is, just love doing it. If you don't love doing it, and you need the money to do the things that you want to love doing, at least in the interim, do the things you kind of like to get that love. But get that love. And I'll tell you, if you don't, you have a wasted life. And I'll tell you, 
the biggest waste in life is a wasted life. And I wish, I wish people told me the same thing when I was in your shoes in those chairs. Because a lot of people did not get that in their lifestyles, in their lifetimes, and got that point at very late ages, very late years. So don't, do, make, don't make that same mistake. Figure out what you love as fast as possible. You don't have to decide what major and so on. They are actually, in my opinion, lesser important things. What's more important is what's in your heart. I never ask people about your plan. What is in your heart right now? So follow your dream, follow your love, follow your heart. I will tell you, you will be successful. And it doesn't matter where you go to school. Obviously, MSU is special. MSU is special. But even if you don't have a college degree, if you love what you're doing, you can still make it happen. Obviously, MSU gives you that additional advantage. So use that advantage. On that note, let me stop here and just open up for Q&A. Jackie, you're looking at me with all the energy. By the way, you know Jackie. You know Jackie? Jackie's new name. What is your new name, Jackie? Microphone, the microphone. Red Bull. Yeah. <laughs> I call Jackie the Red Bull H. <laughs> How do you pronounce your last name? Hager. In German, I would go I know. Berger. You have a German last name, right? Yes. The German okay, let's do QA. Let's start with those people who have passports. <laughs> <laughs> let's start with you. You have a passport. You're a proud passport holder for Texas. Don't be scared. Come on, have guts. Any comments, questions? If you don't agree, I would love to debate. <laughs> Someone is going to go up and say, I don't love things. Good for you. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Introduce, can you introduce yourself and the year you're in? Seven. Introduce yourself and the year. Are you a sophomore, senior? Oh, my name is Bill Vaughn, I'm a senior. You're a senior. And also, and say what's in your heart. <laughs> So we have contextual intelligence to answer your question accurately. So one more time, your name? name Bill Vaughn. Bill Vaughn. And yours? Senior. Senior, and what's in your heart? Well, I was actually going to ask you how What's you in your heart? I had no idea. <laughs> well, you're moving too fast, bud. <laughs> I was going to ask you, uh, how did you figure out what you love? Well, look, it's a good question. And I'm going to give you no BS answer. Are you checking that? <laughs> By the way, meet Steven Spielberg here. <laughs> he loves filming. By the way, get us visit this guy. He's going to be famous. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you really don't know. You, you know it when you... Let me put it this way. You will find it. You, you will realize it when you know it. It's, it's one of those things. It, nobody can tell you. Right? I cannot tell you that. You have to just somehow get that point yourself, and you're gonna find out. Just fall in love with uh, uh, with your mates, you know, with your with your girlfriend, with your husband, your with your uh, uh, boyfriend, whatever that might be. It's it's up to you. When you get to that point, you know. But my, I'll tell you, this is very important. People people sometimes uh, do not value this, and they think it's you know, all warm fuzzy things. It is not. Passion is everything in life. I'm just telling you. I know some of the people are smiling and so on. <laughs> Trust me. Those people are going to call me when they're 60, but it's going to be too late. <laughs> Let me give you an example. The faculty members are here. They have a passion for teaching, and they're living their dream. They're here, not just to for salary with you guys. They're loving what they do. You might not tell us sometimes, right? Because it's, it's, it's stressful, exams, this and that, and so on. Do you think it's easy to deal with you guys every day? <laughs> you need to love the stuff to be with you all day long. Right? They love teaching. They love the energy that you give them. So from your perspective, I cannot tell you that the way it happened to me, I was lucky enough at a younger, younger age, I always wanted to be in business. Running a business was somehow got into me. And my dad was an engineer. He was not a business person, so per se. He always worked for another company. I always wanted to start my own company. That was my dream. And one, one thing is also important. By the way, I, I don't have a, like, I don't do slides, presentations in a specific way. I just talk from heart because I believe in what I'm saying. I live the dream. So I'm not making up the stuff, okay? I'm just telling you as it comes to my, my, my mind. Um, this is also important to have guts in life, right? Because if you love something, you're going to have guts. And people who, who love things, who have the passion, you will have the guts. So I have the guts with a few friends who started a business when I was 15. 
I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. My first business, 15 years old, uh, I lived in Istanbul, big metropolis, big city, 15 million uh, uh, citizens uh, in Turkey. And we did not have in our country at that time a map. You know, when you travel in Europe, you go to a hotel, they give you a city map with businesses. Yeah. We did not have one in Istanbul. Uh, Turkish people are usually good business people, they are good traders, uh, historically. But someone did not figure out that there might be a need for tourists to use a map. So we just copy from it and set up, there is no by the internet at that time, okay? I'm 15, when I was 15, this is like in, in 1842. <laughs> <laughs> just in the 19th century, World War I, not happy yet. So, look at this is like the 1980s, the patch mode was hot. My parents go like this. <laughs> so, so it was like the early 1980s, and we said, you know, let's let's start a map. So we literally copied a black and white map, not even colored, and we started selling map locations to businesses. And some businesses were laughing at us, like it's all you know, mom and pop shops. So I'm not gonna do it. But once we sold one, <coughs> then the second one wanted to be in there. All of a sudden, we made tons of money. 15, 16 year old kids making this money, and I just tasted the value of money. And I remember walking the streets, no car, no driving, no money, I didn't probably prove that money, didn't have money. So we literally did a you know, suitcase, funny looking suit and tie, walking 15 year old kids, walking, selling advertising. That was my first business ever. We did not even start a business. It was fun, and getting that first check from the first customer, mom and pop shop, I remember it was a dry cleaner. And, and it just sold this today's money, like what, three hundred dollars for a you know six month map location. It was an amazing money. Can you imagine that you're a kid and you know what taught me? When you have guts, when you have when you can take risks, you can do anything. We did not have internet, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have we didn't have cars, we just walked in the heat of the summer selling those maps. We stunk, right? It's just sweating crazy. <laughs> but it was the best fun ever. Right? That was probably one of those areas that I felt like, hey, something like, you know, something big can happen. And one of the pieces helped me out also to, to answer the, your question in a long uh, 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 answer is travel, meeting a lot of different people, different cultures. And I'll tell you, you guys are so lucky at MSU. It's a small school in a small town, and there's so much cultural diversity here. <coughs> in the Air Force Base, you have 12 native country pilots are here with their families. For a small school at MSU with five, 6,000 students, you have a lot of diversity here. Learn from each other because the world is going to be one country, you like it or not. We are connected. Boundaries are there, but they're all virtual boundaries. Everything is going to be connected. Yes, there are governments, there are different languages and so on, but you're going to be selling and buying from each other. Look at your clothing, from your underwear to your t-shirt, everything is made somewhere else and they're selling you. We have to find in the US to selling others. So we need to learn from each other and respect each other and, and, and understand each other's weaknesses and strengths so we can create opportunities. So those are the things as I learned a lot from my family, from my travels and so on, created in my mind, I love doing business. And what I saw was when I was at an MSU early 90s, technology was booming. I said, this is the biggest opportunity. If I'm gonna do business, do it in technology. Then I fell in love with technology because it's changing people's lives. And if you want to be prosperous around those things we talked about, you need to have technology. From education to environment to financial services, technology is in everything. Those were probably the dimensions. But good question, that was my path to what I love. But your path might be, who knows? You're going to be a tennis player, I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Again, three answers I need. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Speak up so they can hear you. Charlie Motherwell, I'm a freshman. Okay, what's your in your heart? What's in my heart? Food right now. Food! <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be a chef! <laughs> right there? Cooking or eating? Both. Oh. Okay, you're gonna be a chef. Cooking is a great chef unless you like eating. By the way, I'll tell you, a very good friend of mine is a chef. I asked him, and he, he has one of the best restaurants in the world, in Napa Valley, in California. Um, he owns a lot of restaurants, like Bouchon is one of them, he's a French restaurant, and, and, and he, he owns French laundry, and you know what he says? I love cooking. That's why he became a chef. He loves food and he likes to eat food, and good food. It's all about love. I'm not kidding. I'm not making up stories. You can't call him. His last name is Kelly. Go ahead. Why did you choose the bankrupt company? Why did I choose a bankrupt company? Very good question. Why did I choose a bankrupt company to start working? Because it was cheap. 
<laughs> I always go for cheap, great value, and sell it high. Why did I come to MSU? It was in Chi. I'll tell you why. It was the best value for the money. It's the best value for it. It's the best faculty that I could find and I could learn in a small classroom with one-on-one -on -one interaction. And it's a great town, it's an international town, and coming from overseas, I wanted a place that I really had get a feel for heartland. You know, Texas was a phenomenal experience for me, coming from overseas, very unique. Because most international students come to US, end up in Boston, New York, and Eastern Seaboard, if they're coming from Europe. If they're coming from Asia, they end up in the West Coast, you know, in the coastal cities. Uh, um, this was very unique. There are not many people like me uh, from my country who came to Texas. I now go to business in Austin. I do business a lot of with uh, uh, you know Midwestern companies, and the fact that I went to school in Texas breaks the ice. It's it's an amazing differentiator for me. So going back, a uh, white bankrupt company. I was looking to run on my business. I was not smart enough to create technology from scratch, like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or or Google Brothers, right? Their last name is out of Google, by the way. Not you know, Saturday very Google. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so since well, I was not an engineer smart enough, I had to get a shell company to build my business on the top with the smart people who are helping me build the company. So the, the quickest way was to find a you know backup company. Now look, I had money. I just I was lucky to be with the right companies, to work very hard. I didn't take summer vacations, I worked every year because I love it. Not, nobody told me to work. Um, I love what I do and I enjoy. So when people do spring breaks, I worked. I sold spring break vacations to students, the bus trips, and so on. There's always a money a, a, a engagement for me, and I enjoy doing that. If you don't enjoy doing that, that's a choice in life. Then become an artist and become the best artist you can be. Become a butcher, whatever you want to be, right? But you love it, right? Going back. So I just wanted to find a company. So I found this company, uh, and I loved it. I loved the people there, even though it was bankrupt, it was cheap, with very little money. This is about uh, seven years ago, after 2005. With very little money, I invested. I owned a big portion of the company to help me to build on it. That was the reason. And that's the reason why I came to invest you again. Best value for the money. That's, that's the reason. And now, look, MSU got twice as big <coughs> in the last 20 years. And I am the biggest supporter of MSU. <coughs> you know why? You know why I'm here? Because I'm going to sell the big clients. You are my customers. Do you think I'm joking? <laughs> <laughs> I never do anything for no reason. And don't do anything in your life for no reason. There must be always a reason. And it doesn't mean it's a bad reason. I don't believe, for instance, in charity. <clears throat> I do a lot of work with education in schools and give them tremendous discounts and help because we believe, as a company, sustainability. Because you can give a poor person fish, and they can eat the fish, and the fish is over, and then they eat the second fish. It's much better, as you all know, teaching people how to fish. Giving a person uh, um, skills to fish is much better than giving the fish, right? So from that perspective, our value proposition to the company is work with education, work with companies who are distressed, help them to find a way, and then once they're successful, then we get our money back. Best examples come from history, like think about Marshall plans. You know Marshall? Marshall plans from World War II, after World War II? Europe was completely ruined. Most countries would go and conquer Europe. US was the winning, winning country after the World War II. But US didn't go to Germany and conquer Germany and make the 51st state. A lot of countries would think that way. When you think about imperialistic uh, um, needs and trends, usually the winner conquers everything. But US is an always a democratic and 